Okay, our session's being recorded. This is week nine of data 610 for the summer, 2015. There you go. Okay, I think we're moving along nicely. Now, this week starts a uh, short couple of weeks session on your third software package, third and final one. Uh, it's probably the one that um, most people enjoy the most. I won't say it's the most powerful or most, you know, does all the things others do, but something different. It's another predictive modeling tool and user tool called Big ML, ML standing for machine learning. Very, very powerful for one specific aspect, and that is decision trees. Uh, and that's why I save it for this portion of the course where we talk a little bit about rule-based systems and decision trees. It also can do clustering. They added that uh, about a year ago, but we don't do much with it. Uh, but if you're curious about an interesting application of clustering, I would watch the little demo they have on that. But we'll say more about that in a minute. So I'm going to give you a little background on rule-based systems, which is what part and parcel of what decision trees do. So we have to talk a little bit about rule-based systems. And I'll be, uh, as a reminder, I'll be looking at the, uh, the assignments you handed in Sunday or earlier. I'll be looking at those this week and get you some feedback on that. Meanwhile, you should be learning uh, this uh, package big ML. You should have your account by now. I sent out an email saying for you to go to the uh, go to the website, sign up, and uh, put a code in, and they give you a free uh, license. And again, this one runs entirely at their website. So this is a pure cloud-based system. Uh, once you load the data set in from your hard drive, it's all done at their servers. So there's not even a small client or anything to install. It's not using Excel or anything. It's using proprietary software. But very interesting software for a few reasons, more of which you'll hear about later. Okay, so let's move on here. The, the agenda, as always. Uh, I think it's important to have a little background on rule-based systems, which is what we get from a decision tree approach. We get the ability to turn something into a set of rules. And then we'll talk a little bit about big ML and so forth. Okay, so we have two weeks dealing with that. You'll have an assignment due again, as always, at the end of week 10. This is the beginning of week nine. Now you say, well, that's only two weeks, but that's really plenty of time for this software. Uh, it's relatively easy to learn, to use at a very uh, high level. If you wanna learn all the bells and whistles, as always, more practice, more time, more uh, experimentation is what I would recommend but it's certainly really good software. So let's back up and talk a little bit about what are business rules. You know, if the barometer is dropping and the weather report predicts rain, then you should carry an umbrella. That's a rule. Most rules are if then. Sometimes there's if this and that and that and that then. Sometimes there's if this or that then take an umbrella. So there can be a combination of ifs, ands, ors, elses, and so forth. But you'll see in a moment when we talk a little bit more about it that <clears throat> there's a big difference between building rules by hand and building rules with machine learning. But what are they? Well, a directive. This is a definition, one directive, one definition. A directive intended to influence behavior. A formal expression of knowledge or preference. A guidance system for steering behavior. Statements of the actions you should take when certain conditions are true. Now, the last one, I think, is the closest to what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, rule-based systems really go back to the beginnings of artificial intelligence. One of the, well, not one of, the first artificial intelligence systems that were built were all rule-based. Okay. We go back to the mid-70s. And there were several very successful ones built. Mycin, uh C4.5, others that were built. Um, the uh, Mycin one diagnoses rare blood disorders and does it better than doctors do. Still around, by the way. Uh, others help you fix things and so forth. So we have literally over 100,000 rule-based systems out there. If you've ever used a simple tax package like TurboTax, behind the scenes, behind the, the forms you see and the calculations you're doing are rules. If you make more than $2,500, then you have to file this. If you did this and that and that, then you can take a deduction. It's all running behind the scenes. 
So rule-based systems are by far the most popular and most uh, implemented kinds of systems. But many of them were built by hand. We're now at the point where we build them, although a different kind, with machine learning. Okay, So they're everywhere, as I mentioned. Policy manuals. If you were gone for three days and slept two nights in a approved hotel, then you can file a travel voucher. Regulations. If, again, you make more than $2,500, then you have to file. If you are putting certain pesticides down, you have to fill out a certain form. Okay? So these are out there everywhere. But there are two distinct, differently different kinds. All of them, however, all of them, all the kinds of rule-based systems lead to a decision. Just as the simple one I cited, if it's rain, if it if the barometer is dropping and the weather forecast is rain, then take an umbrella. So, and again, you could put a, a confidence level on that. You could say I'm 80% sure you should take an umbrella. And that doesn't mean you have to take an umbrella, but 80% confidence going to rain, you have to take an umbrella. Okay. So they all lead to decisions. Well, that's what this whole course is about. We're trying to to convince you that the world of analytics really needs to work harder at tying analytics and decisions together. It's one thing to build models, but you have to tie that to decisions. And of course, uh, those decisions for the most part are either business or business related kinds of decisions. So that's really the impetus of what we're, we're putting together in starting you out in the MSDA program, thinking about analytics and decisions. Now, what do you get from a rule-based system? Well, first you get consistency of results. They don't change, they don't tire, they don't skip steps. Uh, they run through the same procedure every time. Unlike humans, especially human experts, sometimes human experts will skip steps, sometimes they'll get tired, sometimes they'll forget steps. A codified expert system is not going to do that. It's not going to skip any steps, no shortcuts. We have documented cost set time savings of many of them, of over 100 to 1. One example, the entire penal system sentencing for the state of Tennessee is done by a rule-based system. Prior to implementing this system, which was built by hand, based on the regulations, <clears throat> about 80% of the prisoners were serving the correct sentence. Some were staying too long because people had incorrectly figured out consecutive or uh, overlapping sentences. Of course, you get time off for good behavior and you get time added on for fighting in the cafeteria. You're serving consecutive and you're serving sequential sentences and so forth, uh, minimum mandatories and so forth. So they're about 80% correct. I mean, some people are getting out too early and should have stayed longer. Some people are getting out too late and should have gotten out earlier. They built an, a giant expert system called Thomas. And that system is 100% correct in having you stay the requisite amount of time in jail. It also, it also saves the state of Tennessee 32,500 labor hours per month. 32,500 labor hours per month. Um, that's quite a savings. You say, how does it do that? Well, we used to have people doing this. That's why it was only 80% correct. They'd look at the regs and they'd thumb through pages and go back and forth and say, well, you're in for aggravated this and you did this and you did that. And they try to figure out the sentencing. So where are those people? Well, they've either been freed up to work on more meaningful tasks or, to be honest, they may have been freed up to seek employment elsewhere. You see, I have an artificial intelligence background, and I've taught entire courses in expert systems where we built expert systems by hand. And I'm going to cite a couple of good programs that you could do that with. However, it's different, and I'll point out the, the key difference in a moment. So we get these cost set time savings, and there are many, many examples. We also get codified knowledge. <clears throat> One of the biggest assets you have in your organization today, of course, is the intellectual capital that's carried around by the employees. And we need to codify that knowledge and share that knowledge. We need to have knowledge management, as we've talk, talked about in the business world for a couple of decades now. Well, how do you do that? How do you take an expert and codify his or her knowledge? Well, if you're building the rule-based system by hand, you have to sit down and talk to them and say, how do you do that? How do you make that decision? Try to distill that. And that's often difficult because many times, that comes from years of experience, and it becomes almost innate 
it becomes tacit knowledge where people don't even think about it. When you use a rule, when you use a machine learning uh, basis to develop the rules, you will see them and they become codified. People can now learn from them. They may look and say, gee, that, that rule makes a lot of sense. That's how we do it. Or they may look and say, gee, that's an odd rule. Where did that come from? And then you show them the evidence because machine learning has to learn from past evidence. Maybe something's changed and the rule needs to be changed or modified. That's fine. But it provides a way to codify knowledge, which I think is a big uh, misunderstood advantage of rule-based systems. People don't often think about that. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the human experts are freed for complex problems. Uh, again, if you're a doctor who spends her time half or, half her day advising people about bunions and half her time doing heart surgery, heart transplants, uh, we can build a rule-based system to advise people about bunions pretty easily. And so that would free her up to do heart transplants. If all you knew were what to do about bunions, however, and we built an expert system that advised people on that, you would be out of a job, wouldn't you? So it can work either way. So, uh, you know, there is a, a, I guess you could call it the downside. I don't see it as a downside. It's just a fact of life that we do change things. So business rules, what do they look like? Well, as I said, they're all if-thens. If customers, goal customer and home equity loan value more than 100000 then college loan discount equals a half percent. And again, you can provide the rationale or the background for that. If member has greater than three prescriptions, prescription renewal date is less than 30 days in the future, then set reminder to email and so forth. Rules, rules, rules. And of course, we have to be able to uh, tie these rules together. We have to be able to manage these rules. We're going to talk a little bit in week. Uh, well, we talked a little bit last week about business management systems. And that's where that comes in. You have to be able to manage, capture, update, maintain, and operationalize the rules. And that's, again, one of the huge pluses of Big ML, as you'll see when you get into it. Okay, so how do we build the rules? Well, I mentioned two ways, by hand and using machine learning. And you might say, oh, well, I'm sure machine learning is much more efficient, much more effective. It is. It's faster, certainly. But, but the rules are a different type. Again, I've taught entire courses in expert systems or rule-based systems, we now call it, rather than expert systems. And, and we did those by hand. You work with a domain expert, again, to distill his or her experience and code that into rules. It's time-consuming. It's costly. The expertise may not be available or the person may not be willing to share his or her expertise because they understand that you might be replacing them. And it's difficult to maintain because we don't have one standard way of doing it. Nonetheless, having said that, if you are at all curious, you should go visit these at least one or two of these, one or both of these sites, Exus, which I've used for many years, and LPA, a British company I've used as sporadically. In fact, I'm going to flip over to uh, Exus real quick. This is Exus. If you're going to build a rule-based system by hand, this would be the package I would recommend you use. There are over 3,000 expert systems built with Exus, real-world systems, not toys. And if you say, well, I'd like to see some of those, uh, well, I go to application areas, and you'll see that regulatory compliance, and I'm showing these for a reason, not just to not just the, you can see making the government more efficient at OSHA. They have many expert systems, India National Labs, Argonne National Lab, Department of Labor. So these are not chopped liver. These are real companies or government agencies where there are a lot of rules to manage. Now, what's different about them uh, than, than the machine learning ones is this final bullet. This is key. That's why I was showing you just a glimpse of the Exus website. Most of the rule systems built by hand are not predictive. They're advisory. When you go to look at um, uh, some of the application areas, you know, regulatory compliance, it's not going to predict anything, okay? Uh, it's going to tell you that, you know, if, can you have uh, parental leave from the government, for example? How long can you stay out on sick leave? Uh, how do you how do you comply with uh, choosing a legal business structure? Should I go a limited liability or a small business or incorporate? These are advisory systems. How do I manage pest management at USDA? If you see 
a certain type of uh, bug on your, this one's for, uh, I believe this one's for uh, uh, nuts and peanut plants, and it works great. And it basically has a couple of hundred rules, and it says if you see a certain kind of aphid on your peanut plants, and if it hasn't rained for six days, and if you use this kind of fertilizer, then here's what you need to do. Advisory systems, repair systems, things like that, but not predictive. Not trying to predict who's going to default on a loan. Not trying to predict who's going to commit fraud or who's going to churn from the company. Advisory systems, for the most part, I'd say 99%. On the other hand, as I said, they work great. They have tremendous savings. And once they're built, they're phenomenal, but hard to maintain, hard to build, costly. On the other hand, we can build them with machine learning. Now, machine learning works differently. It says, give me some past data where you can identify the inputs and what happened, and I will figure out how to connect them. It's, almost, it's what you did already with uh, prediction. Prediction has, as you know, a decision tree and a rule-based system module in there. And if you did that, you saw a little decision tree emerge out the end. So we use software, where, but you have to have lots of past data where we can identify the inputs and the answer, and the decision tree figures out how they're connected. It's compared to by hand, it's relatively quick, inexpensive, and easy to explain and update. It is predictive in nature or classifying, either predicting someone will churn or we're classifying someone as a churner or non-churner. Quite different than the ones built by hand. Both have tremendous value, by the way, don't get me wrong, but different. So you can't just say, well, I'm just going to build all my expert systems with machine learning because they not all of them can be built with machine learning. Again, lots of past data, lots of variables. You can't say I'm going to build them all by hand. It just takes too long and it's too cumbersome. These are easy to operationalize, another advantage. So we have two basic kinds. Now, we, in this course, naturally, are going to focus on building the rules with machine learning. And with machine learning, you build them via a decision tree. Again, if you did this in prediction, and most of you probably did, probably said, okay, I'll include decision tree as one of the techniques, along with maybe regression and or neural networks and some of the others. Then you saw something like this emerge when you were done, okay? It starts with an existing customer and tries to classify them as grandfather issue change, grandfather meaning grandfathered on the rules, issue change, retract quote, issue warning. In other words, results, these are answers. We start with a big blob of data, and basically what the, the, the machine learning does is continually find which of the input factors, they don't have to be yes, no, by the way, just example, which of the input factors does the best job of splitting subgroups into more homogeneous groups. So if this was our database of all the people in our company, some who have churned and some who have not churned, meaning churned, meaning left the company, and some didn't pass data, always have to have pass data, we might ask a question, uh, let's say it's a phone call. How many phone calls did they make? Oh, I see. The ones who churn tended to make fewer phone calls than the ones who did not churn. Now, I will say a little bit about how we get these what we call splits. There is a methodology behind the scenes at Big ML, at Prediction, at SAS Enterprise Miner, in all software packages that goes through and determines the best factor to split on and the best value of the best factor to split on. Now, how does it do that? Well, believe it or not, it checks every single factor and every single value of every single factor and then picks the best one. And then once they're split, it says, okay, now which one would be the best one to split them further and further and further until you decide to stop. We'll talk a little bit about when you decide to stop and why you decide to stop in a minute. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of how that figuring out which is the best value of the best factor works. You'll learn that in, in great detail in data 640 when we use the predictive modeling and do SAS Enterprise Miner. It's using something called entropy, something called the Gini index. You don't need to worry about that at this time. But it does do that. It does check 
every single factor and every single value of every single factor. Now, some factors will only have a couple of values. Like if you decide to split on gender, you know, male, female. But if you decide to split on salary, you might have to split on a lot of different values, 10,000, 10,500, 11,000, 11,500, you know, it checks them all behind the scenes and then picks the best one. <clears throat> and the best one is the one that more clearly separates the pot above it into more homogeneous groups below it. Okay. And you'll see this when we, when we, when we do some with big ML, you say, Oh, I see it really did put them in the better pots. So if we started here with uh 50, 50 pot, 50% 50 of the customers churn, 50% did not churn. When we make that first split, we would expect to see in the ones in, in the yes, meaning churn, we would expect to see something above 50% in this pot. And for no churn, we'd expect to see something above 50% in this pot did not churn and so forth and continue, continue splitting until we get more and more homogeneity in the groups. It's a very powerful way of thinking through the problem. And of course, I'm from the uh, the days when you did these evaluations by hand, so you didn't do very many. Now, of course, any power, any piece of software we're using does it so fast that you don't even notice it hardly. So it's going on behind the scenes. Okay, so again, separating observed data into subgroups, recursive partitioning. So it partitions, then it looks at the partitions it just created and says, can I divvy them up again? Can I divvy them up again? Can I divvy them up again? And then each path through the tree, let me go back, the path through the tree would constitute, so this, a yes here and a yes here, ending up in grandfather would end, would be a rule. If the answer to this question is yes, and if the answer to long-term question is yes, then you're grandfathered, okay? That's how simple the rules can be. So the rules end up being easily understood. You might not agree with them. You might say, oh, really? And, and of course, the answer would be yes, because that's what our past data, that's what has happened. You know, it's hard to argue. They're easy to explain. The rules are easy to explain, easy to see. That makes decision trees the most popular technique for doing predictive modeling, the most popular technique. Popular does not always mean most accurate. There for you. And of course, we can use decision trees for classification, which is their primary use, or prediction. So they can handle interval values. They're better, to, they're better suited, probably, for classification, where I end up putting them into several discrete plots. Again, I said they were the most popular. Here's a recent survey from TDWI, the Data Warehouse Institute. They do great, great work. They do a lot of surveys. They give me, they provide me and, and anyone else who wants to go read their reports, valuable real world information. I love that, as you know by now, because I'm here teaching and reading textbooks and reading magazines and articles and journals, but I really like to get a feel for what's going on in the real world. And you can see decision trees way out here. Far more popular, for example, than something much harder to explain and do neural networks far more hop popular than some regression techniques, although linear regression is very popular and so forth. Um, so the pros and cons, <clears throat> a lot of pros with decision trees, in addition to the ones I've already mentioned. I already mentioned they were easy to explain, easy to understand, easy to operationalize. Beyond that, guess what? It can handle variables without any smoothing or transforming those. Now, you haven't done much of that, if any. Some of you may have done a little bit with prediction. But you will find, especially when you get into areas like regression and neural networks, the distribution of the input variables has to be as close to normal as possible for those models to work well. Decision tree says, I really don't care what the distribution looks like. Similarly, regression models, neural network models, do not like to have missing data. Decision tree, not a problem. Regression, neural networks, you have to decide or give it some help in picking the variables you want to use as the predictors. Decision tree, not a problem. It looks at all of them and picks the best ones automatically. It can use numeric and discrete variables, unlike regression, which requires all numeric variables. And of course, translates into transparent rules for use, which neither regression 
neural, neural networks for two big examples do. So those are some very powerful pros, aren't they? What are the cons? The cons are you need a pretty large data set to get a good model because you'd like to have lots of inputs to choose from with lots of values in those inputs. In other words, lots of cases and a lots of variety in the combinations of the inputs in the cases. The last one, of course, is another biggie. It may not be as accurate as a regression model or a neural network model or a support vector machine. And, you know, it depends on how much less accurate it is. Sometimes it is the most accurate, by the way. I can't always say that. But most of the time, it won't be as accurate, especially if you have not a lot of nonlinear relationships, as you will find with regression and or neural networks. So you have to decide. Those other techniques are harder to use, but maybe more accurate. This one's easier to use and easier to develop, maybe less accurate. Of course, the bottom line might be how much less accurate. How hard is it going to be for me to explain to my bosses a neural network or a regression compared to this? Uh, and so the trade-offs. That's part of being a data scientist is understanding those differences. And again, you get a lot more on this in uh, Data 640. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons, again, you might want to go with something that's a little more understandable and easier to use is because look who's going to be using predictive analytics tools in your company. And the number one user is business analyst. Well, try explaining a neural network to a business analyst. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. It's a little bit difficult because neural networks are complicated and they work strangely. So, you know, you're going to be dealing with people in the organization who may not want to put much faith in techniques they don't understand. You may have to use something like a decision tree, which produces easily understood rules. Uh, one more chart. To what extent do you believe the following skills are necessary? Okay. You can see the number one answer here, knowledge of the business. Critical thinking, second. Knowledge and understanding of the source data. Training in predictive analytics, way down. So if the people don't think you need to know a lot about these fancier tools, maybe again, you'd be better served in many cases to stick with something like decision trees. Okay, so that's your brief background. I'll say a little bit more about rules next week after you've had a chance to look at some of the big ML uh, aspects. But that's your brief background on rules. They're very powerful. They are of if-then format, and they're easy to understand and use. Now, why are we dealing with big ML software? Well, that's what it does. It has specialized so far, and they're adding new stuff every six months or so. But so far, it's specialized in building um, rule-based systems. And I mean building them slick. <laughs> Key features, standalone program, and I mean absolutely standalone. You do not have to have Excel or any type machine or anything. It runs entirely through the servers at Big ML. You will also notice when you go there that it's free. As long as your problem is 16 megabytes or less, you can use the Big ML software for free forever. It runs in the cloud. So again, as long as Big ML is available and you have good bandwidth, you shouldn't have a problem. It has what I would consider to be a pretty unique approach. Another reason to show it to you in this sort of display of some end user tools in this course. It creates decision trees from data sets. It automatically creates rules from those trees. I said it's pretty easy to create a rule, but it does it for you automatically. And those rules can be exported in, I think it's 15 or so different languages, Java, uh, XML, et cetera, et cetera, you know, whatever you'd like. So you can immediately operationalize that and put it right into the code your company uses. And of course, you can create many models and compare. Again, now that the heavy lifting in terms of computational effort has pretty much been removed from all the packages, prediction doesn't require you to do any calculations by hand, big ML, uh, SAS, SPSS, none of them, rapid minor, none of them did you do predictions, did you do calculations by hand which used to be a showstopper because you couldn't even do a reasonable size problem and you certainly couldn't build multiple models even if you did do a problem by hand or with a calculator. Uh, and this is 
you know, a big difference. Now that you can build multiple models, why not? Build multiple models, slightly different in each one, whether it's a different technique or a different set of inputs, or in the case of decision trees, which always will use the same set of inputs once it finds the best set, an ensemble model. We'll talk about ensembles next week. Multiple models, and then you compare them for accuracy, and you go with the best one. So you could build, in some cases, uh, not with big ML, but with, with other software, as you may have done with prediction. You could have used a neural map, you could have used a regression, you could use decision tree and other methods, and then look at the look at the results in the accuracy charts and see which one was best. With big ML, you will build multiple models, but they'll all be decision trees, and you'll build what we call an ensemble model, a random forest model. And we don't need to worry about what that is tonight. There are some galleries available. Okay. Galleries available means that model's already built. And that'd be good to look at, to give you an idea of what one of these things looks like, because they look a little strange at first. Now, Big ML uh, does not really provide much in the way of documentation. I know there's some of you that don't like that, like to have documentation, as do I. But however, the good news is it is so easy to learn and use, you really don't need the documentation. I know you hear that quite often and you don't believe it much, but it's true. What, I, what they do, however, have are excellent overviews of the program. They also have, and I'll come back to these, they also have tutorials. But let's talk about the overviews. Every time they release a new version, and they seem to release one about every six months, sometimes more often, they do a very extensive webinar where they walk you through the features, showing examples and demos. And it's fascinating. They're great. So here they are. You know, this is a starting point. This is an overview of the whole program, which is a good place to start. Then you might want to do them in sequ sequential order. Jan Fall 13 webinar. This was probably about when we first started using BML. Actually, uh, we started later than that because our first cohort didn't start 610 until spring of 2014. But this was the first sort of release of the big uh, ML package. It's relatively new. And this explains the program and has a great demo problem, a churn problem, showing exactly how it can be used for that kind of problem. Then in January 2014, <coughs> another walkthrough with some new features, basically ensembles. So if you want to take a peek ahead at what we're going to talk a little bit about next week, you can read, watch that. And what I found fascinating is they took a real-world data set from Prosper and showed how quickly you can build an answer. Now, what do, why did that impress me? Well, let me just tell you what Prosper is. Prosper is a lending service. You probably have heard some of their ads on TV and radio. Um, you go to the Prosper and say, uh, I'm Steve Cadot. I'd like 10 grand to do something with. Tell them what. And of course, give them permission to look at your uh, credit rating and so forth. And then all the people who have the 10 grands to loan bid. I'll loan it to you for 6%. Well, I'll loan it to you for five and seven eighths, or I'll loan it to you for five and a half. I'll give you five years at five and a half. No. So they will, they will offer, make offers to you for that. Of course, the worse your credit rating and, 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 Maybe the crazier the purpose you want to use the money for, the higher the interest rates. But basically, there are a bunch of people out there with a bunch of money, and they've cut out the middleman, more of the disintermediation that seems to be taking place on almost everything, whether it's buying plane tickets or movie tickets or whatever. So that's what Prosper is. Now, what did they do with it? Well, Prosper, they went and got a, the Prosper data set, which is enormously large. And I believe it was a, a, one of the Kaggle challenges. If you haven't visited Kaggle yet, K-A-G-G-L-E, Kaggle is a different website where people put out problems and say, I'll give $25,000 for somebody who can build a model to do this, or I'll give $50,000. Of course, that's where Netflix gave a million dollars to somebody who could come up with an algorithm that did a 10% improvement on recommending movies. And after a, a, a few months to a year, a, a group did. Unfortunately, the model was so complicated it never got implemented. Different story. But they went and downloaded the Prosper data set that was on Kaggle, 
built a model in about, I think they said about 30 minutes, submitted it to Kaggle and finished about 28th or 29th out of uh, several thousand entries. But they only spent 30 minutes. Some of these other people spent months. They were just trying to illustrate how fast you can build a very good, a very good decision tree model with a large data set. And I think it's very impressive. So that's another webinar. Each of these webinars is probably 30 minutes long. Um, then in spring 2014, they released clustering. Okay, clustering. And clustering, as you know, is a non-supervised model. You don't have a target variable, but it's still interesting. And they have a very good clustering module. We're not going to do anything with that. But if you want to see it in action and see how fascinating it is, it's a great webinar to watch. In late summer of 2014, they released uh, their latest, uh, another version, not their latest, another version. And this one put in anomaly detection. Now, why is that important? Well, it won't be all that important with us, but if you are dealing with real world data, you have to first cleanse your data. And part of cleansing it is identifying and remediating anomalies. Anomalies could be, uh, you know, things that are outliers, things that are missing values, et cetera, et cetera. In winter of 2015, so this was just a few months ago, they came up with an improved version, which had more cloud storage expanded, more login options, projects concept introduced, uh, and so forth. So those are those are webinars that you might want to watch to get a feel for the program. Uh, and by the way, they have some other, other features that I don't have on this slide. One is a, one great feature is if you build a model, you can send a link to that model to anyone in the world and say, look at the model I built. See what you think of it. They don't have to understand big ML or anything. It'll, it'll be very clear to them what you've done. That's how easy it is. Now, when you're ready to say, okay, I've seen enough, I'm ready to think about building a model myself, then these tutorials are ideal, and they're short. They're 10, 15 minutes long at most, uh, and they will walk you through the steps, getting started, creating a data set, creating a model, interacting with the model, generating predictions. It's that simple. Great, great software. Very big, very big fan I am of that. So these are the actual tutorials that I'll walk you through. In addition, I have created, as I did with prediction, a walkthrough at this website. And you'll see me walk through and build one. And I did this with minimal amount of training when I first started using the software. Um, so, you know, I created one there. Uh, other information that might be of interest to you, they have a, a fascinating blog. Uh, if you go to the ML, this is the blog site for Big ML, and um, over here, well, I got to move some of this over a little bit. They have a word cloud. They said, "Oh, I'd really like to know about ensembles." Here are all their blog entries for ensembles. Okay, how they work and all. Really, and their, their blogs are great. In fact, I put I put a link to um, a couple of them uh, in the uh, announcement for today. You know, part one and part two, everything you want to know about machine learning, but we're afraid to ask. Those are great blogs. So, you know, they have a blog that they keep very current. A lot of people let their blogs slide, but you can see they've been posting quite a few blog entries uh, since the company began. You can either do them by categories or you can do them by date. So you might want to look at some of their blogs and see if any of these things are interesting to you. And finally, something that should be of interest to you is they have a direct tie with their software and Tableau. Uh, pretty interesting because Tableau, as you had some familiar with in, in 600, is a great, great dashboard package for visualizing data. If you can combine the ability to visualize data with the ability to predict from that data, now you're starting to put together a couple of pretty powerful aspects of the world of analytics. So you might want to look at their uh, their video showing how that's done. And those of you who are, uh, you know, I teach Tableau in the uh, MBA program, so I'm a big fan of Tableau. 
<clears throat> it's certainly the best end user dashboard package going. Well, it's tied to Tableau in one way. Not not trivial, but yeah, pretty trivial actually. And it works great. So that'll get you started. You need to spend time. As I say, with every one of these uh, software packages, if you spend time, if you experiment, if you try things, you're going to find that you've learned quite a bit. So in week nine, which starts today, I want you to do the following. Watch some of the videos. Try the walkthroughs. Spend some time exploring things. Ask questions. Build sample models. Look at the gallery models. And then start thinking about what you're going to do for your graded assignment week 10. Now, it is permissible to use the same data set for the week 10 assignment that you use for the week 8 assignment. If you do, you might want to think about perhaps comparing what you found for results in terms of accuracy. Maybe you did the decision tree and prediction, and you're going to do a decision tree in big ML. Some ideas there. Next week, week 10, we'll talk about part two, especially ensembles. Ensembles are very powerful. Uh, when you get into the world of analytics, you find this term ensembles being mentioned a lot. There's one main reason for it. Ensemble models are usually more accurate than simpler models. There's a little bit of a downside, but you know, if you want accuracy, you want to be able to predict very accurately, <laughs> an ensemble model is likely to be better. And then, of course, you will have another your next assignment due at the end of week 10. So you only have a couple of weeks for this. So you want to certainly spend your time wisely and trying the software. But it's so powerful, yet so straightforward and easy to learn. And I think you're going to really like it. That's been the result so far. We've used it every semester. Um, so what you're going to do for that assignment is similar to what you did for week eight. You're going to build at least one model preferably more. Uh, you're going to interpret the results, see if there's any interesting things there, and then talk a little bit about whether or not this kind of approach could work in your organization. If so, how? If not, why not? Okay. And then here we are at the last slide. So a shorter session tonight. I know most of you are still recovering from finishing up the week eight assignment. So take a deep breath and then jump into Big ML. And if you don't have your account yet, you really ought to get that ASAP because we made it as seamless as we could this semester. You just go there and sign up with that code that I sent in the email, and you have a nice subscription that's, that's slick. So I stop now and do the same as I always do. You can ask questions now if there's something I've not been fairly clear on that you think could be clarified right now. You can always ask questions anytime during the week. Let me have any questions as one area. If it would benefit the whole class, but certainly there are other places to put discussion items. Um, and, and as always, any kind of an emergency or personal item, feel free to email or phone call. So let me stop and see if we have any such questions tonight. It looks like, uh, well, we still have one, two, three, four, five, we still have about six or eight people. Everybody else watching the uh, home run contest or something, which is fine. I record the sessions because I know people have other obligations. Okay, well, as I said, you'll be getting some feedback on your assignment you just turned in. I supply that via audio uh, using the Pure Voice software. I think a couple of you have mentioned you have uh, Mac machines, so I, I will convert that to MP3, which is a much larger file, but it's not a hard problem for me to convert and supply it in that thing. So anybody who doesn't have the ability to run the Pure Voice software, needs to let me know and I will supply your audio feedback. It'll, it'll be deposited in your uh, assignment area once I get through grading. Them. It's going to take me a few days because those are, there's a lot of people in the class and those are large assignments and I want to be thorough in looking through what you did and how you explained it and so forth. And I'll give you enough feedback that they'll be constructive uh, for the next time. That's the whole purpose of doing these things. All right, well, no one's asked a question, so the first thing I'm going to do is stop sharing my screen. And the second thing I'm going to do is stop the recording.